So given a number of, well, I say a number, quite a lot of people commenting in posts on various videos on various ships, oh, did you know this has been discovered, that's been discovered, etc. Yeah, yes, I, I have actually been following the exploits of the RV Petrol, and uh, therefore I thought this would be a good opportunity to bring everyone up to speed with the work that the Petrol and its predecessor have been doing in terms of finding wrecked ships. So let's get on with this quick review. So, a mere five years ago, the entries to a great many vessels that were lost in battle read something along the lines of a ship went down at approximately X time at roughly Y location, and that was the last we'd know about them for more than half a century. But then, in 2012, a chap called Paul Allen stepped in. Whilst not as well known as his business partner Bill Gates, Allen was not short of a few bits of spare change thanks to co-founding Microsoft, and he decided, amongst other things, that he wanted to, to help find the wrecks of these ships. This is somewhat easier said than done, given that the deep ocean is not exactly a hospitable place, but when you have several billion dollars and a mega yacht, you can make a relatively easy start. Said yacht, the Octopus, is about the size of the average Treaty-era cruiser, and carries a colour scheme that I highly approve of. Able to therefore search in relative luxury, the research team that Alan hired went on a number of expeditions, but really began to hit their stride in 2015 when they set out for Iron Bottom Sound, a place which was a relative easy mode when it came to wreck searches, since it was, as the name suggests, littered with wrecks and relatively shallow, with water depths ranging from, a, from diveable in scuba gear down to just under a kilometre. Some wrecks in this area had been discovered by previous expeditions over a decade before by Dr. Robert Ballard, but the octopus managed to find new ones as well as reconfirm the location of previous vessels, with three dozen wrecks or wreckage fields located, including such vessels as USS Atlanta, HMAS Canberra, USS Laffey, and the Japanese destroyer Fubuki. Three months later, they rather upgraded the size of their findings by locating the wreck of the Yamato-class battleship Musashi, which, as it turned out, was in substantially worse shape than its sister ship, thanks to suffering a magazine detonation after it had slipped beneath the waves, which rather put pay to a lot of people's ideas of finding a relatively intact Yamato-class hull. In the summer of the same year, the yacht made its way to the North Atlantic, where it made good on an attempt that had been foiled a few years earlier and recovered the ship's bell of the battlecruiser HMS Hood. This was followed by a stint in the Mediterranean around Malta, identifying various wrecks and expended munitions that surrounded the historic island, not limited to the vessels that went down in World War II, since of course Malta has a history stretching back over 3,000 years. But, whilst surveying from a mega yacht is fun, there were more efficient ways of doing the job, and so the next year a small offshore service vessel was purchased and refitted as a survey ship. This became the RV Petrol. Although only about a third the displacement of the octopus, and somewhat slower, the Petrol is somewhat better suited to rough weather conditions and requires significantly fewer crew, allowing more and longer expeditions for the same overall outlay. Also, thanks to being entirely refitted for the purpose, instead of needing to work around other uses aboard, the Petrol is actually more capable than the Octopus, with advanced sonar and underwater remote-operated vehicles allowing it to plumb depths previously restricted to highly specialised vehicles that are normally operated by government agencies, as well as having the ability to hover over a site in spite of most currents or winds, thanks to an array of ducted motors. This whole refit process took about a year, and so its first expeditions took place in 2017, starting off with locating the Italian destroyer Artiglieri, I think, before heading over to the Pacific and setting its sights on one of the holy grails of wreck hunting, the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis, a ship that had carried parts of atomic bombs and had later been sunk with huge loss of life in an incident which remains famous, or perhaps infamous, to this day. However, after about two months of searching, the wreck finally emerged on sonar about five and a half kilometres down. 
Wrecks that survive a plunge so deep are usually easier to ident identify as the immense pressure and cold restricts what can live down there, and so the rust and marine life that takes a toll on ships at shallower depths doesn't tend to affect these ships quite as much. Towards the end of 2017, the ship set out for the Surigao Strait, with permission from the Philippine government, and went looking for the contingent of the Japanese Navy that had decided to grace the seabed with their presence there. Locating both Fuso-class battleships and three of their destroyer escorts, whilst the nearby Ormok Bay would yield three more Japanese destroyers, including the Shimakaze, as well as the USS Cooper and USS Ward, which is of course best known for scoring the first US naval victory over a Japanese vessel, albeit that it contends with the USS Enterprise for the title of first victory in the Pacific War, since technically speaking the Ward's kill came before war was officially declared. 2018 would bring a return to Ormok Bay, finding more Japanese destroyers and gathering more data on the wrecks they'd found earlier, before heading for the Coral Sea. Incidentally, locating a somewhat more modern Greyhound supply aircraft that had crashed a few months earlier. Arriving at the Coral Sea, the ship set about exploring and would locate the wreck of the converted battlecruiser, now aircraft carrier, USS Lexington followed shortly thereafter by locating the USS Juno off Guadalcanal, the ship that took the five Sullivan brothers with it. The next month it was the turn of the Brooklyn class and St. Louis subclass USS Helena to come to light, and then finally off the coast of Papua New Guinea, a step back further in time located the HMASAE. One, try saying that six times quickly, which was an early submarine that was lost with all hands just after the start of World War I. With all that done, it was time for a return to port for rest, refit, and preparations for a new year. But, as it turned out, this was simply a gathering of breath. For although Paul Allen would sadly pass away in late 2018, his legacy was about to give us an unprecedented insight into the lost ships of World War II. Petrel was back on the high seas at the start of 2019, starting with discovering the Japanese destroyer Nizuki a ship with a small but interesting history, being credited with having scored the longest-range torpedo hit in war to date, the hit sinking the USS Strong. Unfortunately, there were no surviving images of the Nizuki when it was above the waves, and thus her Rex photos are the first visual record of this ship. Next month came four new finds, the Japanese cruiser Jintsu, the Congo-class Hiei, and the Yorktown-class USS Hornet. And then, somewhat amusingly, given the location of Nitsuki a month, uh, month before, her victim, the USS Strong, rounded out the month. The Kirishima wasn't too far away, and so they went to have a look at it as well, but that wreck had already been found, so it doesn't enter the list of ships found by the Petrel. This haul meant that Petrel had discovered four out of the seven Japanese capital ships lost at sea, with Kirishima and Yamato already known, and therefore only Congo remaining to be found. March would bring about the discovery of the USS Wasp, meaning that all four US fleet carriers lost in World War II have now been found, three of them by the Petrel, with Yorktown having been found by Dr. Ballard somewhat earlier. This was then followed up by a string of Japanese heavy cruisers. Furutaka showed up in May, Maya in July, and then Megami in September. This also revealed something of a pattern. Whilst many World War II German ships had their sterns break off when they were badly hit or sunk, the Japanese cruisers, and to a lesser extent the American ones, appear to have had a propensity for losing their bows when going down. And then we come to just last month at the time of publishing, which was really a month of carriers. The first wreck found was the USS St. Lowe, an escort carrier sunk during the Battle of Leyte Gulf by one of the first kamikaze strikes, sitting right on the edge of a deep sea trench. Then of course came the big news. The two original Japanese fleet carriers, Akagi and Kaga, were located within two days of each other, marking the first two of the Japanese Navy's lost carrier fleet to be located. And as you can see, both of them took a fair bit of a battering, both above water 
and in Akagi's case especially, when it hit the seabed. Six days later, the cruiser Chakai showed up, also right on the edge of a deep sea trench, and then, a couple of weeks ago, came even better news. Now back when I made the video on the Battle of Samar, I mentioned that it would be hard to find some of the wrecks from this battle, since the battle took place over the aforementioned deep sea trench that some of these wrecks had been found up against. And so a lot of these wrecks would be very far down. However, I clearly hadn't counted on the determination of the RV petrol crew, for just over 6 kilometers down, or over 20,000 feet, there emerged the wreckage of the USS Johnston, or at least some of it, even in death proving to be a rather unique ship, as this is currently the deepest wreck ever located, and it's possible that the ship's hull is actually even further down, as what's been found so far is bits and pieces of the superstructure and upper works, with a very long skid mark going even deeper. The petrol is now back in port for a refit, and so I thought I'd put this video together now, safe in the knowledge that I'm not going to have to throw together a quick update video about even more ships being found, at least for another few months until they set sail in the new season. And since the Akagi and Kaga have been discovered, why don't we celebrate that with a video on how to actually pronounce those ships, as well as the rest of the Japanese flat tops, that video coming to your screens in about 10 to 15 minutes, if you're watching this at the time of release. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.